Yeah. 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 CEO, why don't you right, take a seat right here? Thank you. And uh, this, as you know, is because of our own, and yes, she rides, I take it. She does. And Very seriously. And she, oh, and what uh, type of riding? What does she do? Hunters, jumpers? Uh, she does some jumping, but uh, mainly for the show. Uh huh. Well, we'd have a lot of fun talking about saddles and everything else. Well, that's what she's interested in. Yes. She thinks that politics and foreign policy um, don't go to the core of her life. <laughs> You can tell her that for 37 years, I rode one family of horses. Uh, until just recently, I rode a mare, and then as the years began to pile up, uh, she gave birth to a, a daughter, and I started riding that daughter, and then subsequently, sometime later, uh, the mother bred again, and this time a, a colt. And um, so the daughter came past and left us, and then I rode the son, and then just a couple of years ago at the ranch, uh, he came to the end of the line, and I added it up. I'd ridden those three, 37 years total. She'd be interested in that. You're not. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I've read the beginning of that story in your autobiography, when you first shared the the horse with uh, someone who was involved in a movie with you, I think it was. Nino Pepitone, yes. A former officer in the Italian cavalry. Let me tell you what this strange interview is all about. A piece right. uh, uh, ordered up by my editors on the, on the mind of Ronald Reagan. I think the, the impetus for this is really the sense that here you have been a tremendously successful governor and, pre and president. And yet there is little sense of the thinking behind your decisions, even now. And I guess I've been dispatched to do this piece and to talk to you today, not in any way to debate any of these issues, uh, but with all due respect to, to probe, to see what the memories and associations and um, analyses and anecdotes uh, go into how you've done your job all these years. And it's in that spirit that I will be asking these questions. All right. The first is a question that I guess has plagued you throughout your political life. Why do you think you've been underestimated time and again. Well now, underestimated by whom? I thought you were going to answer that right. <laughs> <clears throat> I think by, by people who write about politics, not only in the press, yeah. but in academia. Um, a lot of the books that have been written about you almost start off with this question. People tend to underestimate this man, the legislators who deal with you, the press that deals with you. Well, as I was going to say, the polls kind of indicate that the job rating right now is <clears throat> uh, very reassuring, even including in your own paper. Uh, so uh, that's why I answered with a, a question. But I think maybe part of it is, uh, of those who, who do, I think part of it is because of my previous profession. Uh, you know, it was only a generation ago that actors couldn't be buried in the churchyard. So uh, I think that must have something to do with it. Do you think it's also because you've not put yourself forward first as, a, as an intellectual governor and an intellectual president that you operate on a, on a different level, that that has something to do with it? Well, it, it could be. I've never, I've never thought about that. I, um, you know, the, my own interest in this was on my own. I, um, I was always a participant. And when I, I grew up a Democrat and a, a New Deal Democrat, and I was, I was always been a history buff. And then 
as the years went by and getting into the business that I was in, in Hollywood, uh, I've often described it as that if you don't sing or dance in Hollywood, you wind up as an after-dinner speaker because the, the request for personal appearances is very great. And having begun as a sports announcer, I had been exposed to the mashed potato circuit by way of football banquets and so forth when the seasons were over. And uh, this continued in Hollywood, becoming a board member, and this is what I mean by a participant uh, of the Screen Actors Guild and six times president of that union, uh, I found that I was, uh, when I wasn't involved in a, in a picture, I was invited to, as a speaker to very various groups. And I usually, I started out then doing as I did when I was in sports and spoke on sports. I started out talking about Hollywood and about our own industry. And gradually to tie it into, if you're talking to a Chamber of Commerce banquet, why should I be talking to them about Hollywood? I used to point out examples of how, because of our penchant for publicity and not good public relations, and because of the, uh, the things that people believed about the profession and the industry, uh, we were victims for discrimination. But if, if I may, you say you're a historical buff. Part of this underestimation may be that that knowledge isn't portrayed in how you explain your policies. That <clears throat> people have a sense of you more as a president operating on the basis of his own personal political experience and instincts rather than a sense of history. Well, yes, but, but you, you have to have a historical background for, uh, I think, really sane policy decisions. But, for example, in making those speeches and talking about things, I found that, and I did my own research, I didn't read a canned speech or anything, and I found that some of the things that I was criticizing, <coughs> for example, what I thought was tax discrimination against the people of the industry that I was in. And no one to stand up for us because who's going to feel sorry for gay mad Hollywood? And, uh, but I would then draw parallels with what could happen to other industries and businesses. Well, pretty soon people were telling me what was happening to them. And there came a day when I had turned completely around from New Deal Democrat to a belief that government had grown beyond the consent of the governed. And that it was government that was contributing to our economic woes, and incidentally, not an intellectual, but my degree was in economics. Uh, and I converted myself and began talking about the things that I thought were wrong and that needed changing in, in government. What historical events guided your thinking and your change in thinking about government at that time? What, what were the dominant historical events that you think shaped your thinking outside of your own personal experience? Well, no, it was pretty much the thing of, 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 that this country started out with this great belief in, uh, in the individual and in individual freedom, in government as close to the people as possible, meaning as much at the local and the state level, that we're a federation of sovereign states. And then I saw that as the federal government grew and kept on growing and usurping most of the tax resources, that the, that, that was disappearing, this very basis of our system, that the states were in danger of becoming administrative districts of the federal government, not sovereign states. And that government was engaging more and more in a kind of adversarial relationship with its own business community. But this again rests a good deal on your own personal experience. What historians did you turn to, or what people did you turn to, to flesh out your own personal sense of this? Well, it, it would be, <laughs> I am a voracious reader, and it would, I, I couldn't pick out this. But, for example, Jefferson, and Jefferson's line that if the government tells us when to sow and when to reap, we shall soon want for bread. Franklin Delano Roosevelt 
And this is history that I think there are a lot of Democrats up there on the Hill that don't know anything about. Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1932, in the depths of the Depression, campaigned on the need to reduce government spending by 25 percent, the need to restore to local communities and states and individuals powers which he said had been unjustly seized, constitutional rights, by the federal government to eliminate useless boards and commissions and departments of government. Uh, how many remember that the New Deal started with a president, that that was his philosophy? Uh, so it was a case of, of uh, not only the past and, the, and seeing where we had gone astray. When I was studying economics, we knew that the classical economists back at the turn of the century, in looking at our so-called uh, business ups and downs, our hard times, as they called it, would periodically come on. Their theory was that they came on every time government went beyond a certain point in the share of the private sector, the gross national product, that government took for itself that government then became a drag on the economy. And uh, so... <laughs> but with, was, with respect, Mr. President, I don't think you're answering my question why? about why you've been underestimated. Because you know this is, this is something that's followed you wherever you've been. You've been successful, and yet the writings have raised all kinds of questions about it. Why do you think that's happened? Well, um, Frankly, I've had a feeling that some of them who are writing that way do it because they know very well what I'm trying to do and they disagree with it. <laughs> so they, uh, <laughs> they write in that fashion. So you think this is more a reflection of uh, different political beliefs That's right. than it is a, a fair look at what you've been doing? Yes. And uh, they've, many of them are inheritors of that era of the big federal government and federal domination, and they don't <clears throat> want to be proved wrong. I'm moving to a second area that's All related right. to this. Uh, as governor, as president, uh, in your experience with the Screen Actors Guild, you were faced with a lot of situations where your advisors and experts, all loyal to you, would have different viewpoints on a problem, yeah. different suggestions. How do you, and how have you, decided between them? What goes on in your mind, in your head, when well, you're faced with these different views from the experts who know all those details, facts? Well, you're right in <clears throat> starting off with president of the Screen Actors Guild because I found myself uh, heading up the guild in the first and only strike that it had ever, un ever, and the strike was forced upon it. I also found out that uh, the membership uh, uh, sort of listened uh, to what I was advocating and our conduct in that strike and so forth, and I, I was worried that I was the welfare of some 30,000 people uh, was hinging on decisions that I made. And I made up my mind as to how I'd make those decisions uh, on a straight basis of what I in my own mind could believe was absolutely the morally right thing to do. When I became governor, uh, I look back now and think it was pretty significant. I created a cabinet-style government. And I think it was unusual, California there. And then I told the cabinet members that we were going to operate like a board of directors, with one exception. We wouldn't take a vote. When I'd heard enough, I'd make the decision. But we wouldn't sit there with one cabinet officer uh, reporting on his particular area and everyone else remaining <coughs> silent. We the round tabled whatever issue policy came before us. And I told them that the one thing I did not want to hear was the political ramifications of any issue. I wanted only to hear debate on was it good or bad for the people. 
because the minute you start thinking about votes and political things, it's a little bit like uh, seeing a, a player's card. You can't take out of your mind that you know where that card is, no matter how honest you want to be. So I said, I don't even want to hear the political ramifications. I listened to them. Then I encouraged them. I wanted to hear every viewpoint. I wanted to hear the pros and cons. And if I didn't hear enough in one session for me to make up my mind on this, I'd say, we'll come back tomorrow. And you'd be surprised that kind of a meeting and discussion that had been going on tomorrow when they came back, you'd be surprised the number that would have changed or modified their previous positions as they had all night to think it over and come in, not for any other reason except, you know, uh, I see so-and-so's point on this and this and this, whatever it was, and then I made the decisions. Well, we do the same thing here. Well, you have been faced with a lot of situations where your advisors really did yeah, disagree. that's right. And it's legitimate to disagree yeah. uh, based on the jobs they have, um, the perspectives they're bringing to bear yeah. uh, on deficits, the difference between Mr. Regan and Mr. Stockman, on uh, Lebanon between Mr. Weinberger and Mr. Schultz. What goes through your mind when they don't agree, when that next day they don't come back? How do no. you decide? I have what to, to decide do? on the basis of all that I've heard, and they all know I now, I think, that uh, we can disagree without being disagreeable. Because uh, uh, when I finally come down on one side or the other, it isn't a personal thing as saying I'm on his side or his side. I give my reasons as to why it gels with what I myself think, and that for that reason we're going to do the following. This is it. And uh, sometimes uh, somebody's a loser and sometimes somebody's a winner. But uh, they all understand that, and I think they accept uh, my making the decisions that way. But is your instinct to try to get them to reach a consensus first? Do you prefer that? Oh, well, of course, it's much easier <laughs> if everything. The, the really tough issues are the ones in which there's so much right on both sides. You know, it's awfully easy if someone is so patently wrong and you say, look, this is the, the morally right and this is the thing that's going to be best for everybody to make that decision. But when you have to say, gosh darn it, <laughs> He's saying things over there that, that make sense also. <clears throat> and then you have to weigh it. But against this over here, what, what is the drawback there? And where are the, the least drawbacks and, and the, the well, most good things? On a situation like Lebanon, which is a, just a, a god-awful series of decisions that you've had to face, um, you hear from your advisors. Do you call anyone beside them? Do you try to read any books about oh. Lebanon? How, how do you bring your own self to bear after you've heard your advisors speak? Uh, sometimes I leave without making a decision and come in here and then, as you say, I review the bidding and all that's gone on. Maybe I call somebody for a little more explanation on a point that was made in the meeting, and uh, did they want to amplify it or not? And uh, then on the basis of those things, I make the decision. But do you call people beyond your own official advisors? For example, your wife. Lots of people think their wives understand them better than they understand oh. themselves. Oh, and Nancy and I talk about things. We have a happy marriage, and like any happy marriage, uh, sure, I, there are no secrets. I go upstairs and uh, tell her and what it is we're talking about and uh, we hash it around and, and talk about it. Sometimes we wind up uh, disagreeing, but again without being disagreeable. And uh, many times it, it helps to talk that out and to hear someone else's reaction to something and you say, well, what, I, I hadn't thought about that. And, uh, but essentially, you look to your official advisors. Yes. And uh, as they, in most of the issues, are privy to, to all the information and all the facts on the case. But it, um, it's worked. And I've, 
I'll tell you, I don't think there have been many cabinet, cabinets that have met in this same way in the past. Now, you know, I have some cabinet members who've been in other cabinets. And evidently before, uh, it was sort of a reporting thing of what was, and no one getting into the other fellow's uh, department. But I can't find many issues in which there aren't several departments that are involved in it. And I've had this experience of early on, now we don't hear it so much anymore, but early on, some of those who'd been in other cabinets, we finished a cabinet meeting, and I've had them at various times say, this is the most substantial, productive cabinet meeting I've ever attended. Because uh, they'd never had that kind of a round table discussion. You've been through this for four plus years now. Has it changed you at all? Has it changed any of your thinking in any ways? What have you learned from the four plus years? Oh my. Well, you'd have to start way back to, I was eight years as governor of California. Uh, for that, that I guess is where uh, the greatest uh, learning came because as I say, for years, I'd been out talking about government. Oh, I was, assailed by a lot of people and praised by others uh, for views that I expressed on what government should do. But then to find yourself in a position to do it. One thing I learned there, and I've learned it, it's, and it's continued here, the learning, it was a shock to discover <laughs> how long it took to get some things done. Bureaucracy does not move swiftly. But, uh, that too, and that incidentally is what made it, I thought it was gonna be very dull. I had never wanted to hold public office in my life. When a group came to me and suggested that I seek the governorship as an instrument of helping to put our party back together after the great divisions in 64, uh, I thought they were crazy, and I didn't want it, and I loved the occupation I was in. I thought, well, you know, I can help fundraisers and things by reason of being in show business and so forth. Told them, fix someone else and I'll help campaign for them. And uh, I really, Nancy and I, we lost a lot of sleep. And finally we were reduced to saying, what if they're right? What if I can win the office for, uh, <laughs> for the cause I believe in it? But we finally had the job and I thought it was, <coughs> It wouldn't be a great change, but I just, let me just sure, say this please. one thing, that it didn't take very long to realize being able to actually deal with it rather than just make speeches about it. I found it more exciting than anything I'd ever done in my life. But did it also change your views on some things? Let me be specific. Uh, before you became president, <clears throat> one of the major issues for you was the question of deficits. Mm -hmm. Something you, you did a lot to erase in California. It's been different here. Uh, also beforehand, you had deep questions about issues such as the Panama Canal Treaty or the SALT II Treaty. But in office, you've behaved differently about these things. Well, uh, the two treaties had came up, come about before I was here. Mm -hmm. Now the Panama Canal Treaty, yes, I was opposed to it. But have you ever heard what it was that I suggested as an alternative? Can't recollect that I have. Well, I suggested that since all of the Americas here, that canal was vital to us, to our trade and all, I suggested why don't we internationalize it and have a board of directors of the canal that consists of representatives of all of the countries to whom that canal is important. But you've held to the treaty nonetheless. No, no, no that, would have been, that would have taken it away. That would have been internationalized. Allow Panama to have the uh, sovereignty Understand. over the territory. But I mean, as president, you've held to the, the treaty and you've well, held to the SALT II treaty. Well, it's passed. Well, the SALT II treaty. No, my objection to the SALT II treaty was because it legitimized the arms race. The SALT II Treaty was a treaty that simply set a limit 
as to how fast and how much you could increase the number of strategic weapons. And I believed at the time that it was well past time when we should be talking treaties that reduced the number of weapons. And I said repeatedly, at the same time I criticized SALT, I said, I will, I will agree to sit at a table as long as it takes to bring about a treaty that will start the reduction of nuclear weapons and hopefully one day the elimination of them totally. Sure. The thing that we're doing now in Geneva. But also, let me explain that when I inherited this agreement that the two countries were sort of observing the terms of the treaty even though it was not formalized, I learned that the Soviet Union had a capacity to increase weaponry much faster than the treaty permitted. We didn't. We had shut down the only missile line we had operating in this country. We had to start from scratch to try and catch up with our deterrent capability under the mad policy of mutual assured destruction that we needed a deterrent enough that would prevent them from the first strike and from starting such a war because we could perpetrate as much damage on them that they wouldn't want to take it. And so I said, and I found the chiefs of staff agreed with me, that because of their superior ability to increase the arms, and we were trying to catch up, that this agreement that had been reached, this informal agreement about both sides observing the terms of the treaty, fine with me because we couldn't produce, as we started, as fast as the treaty would allow us. They could produce faster. So we stuck to it. But as we've seen them, when it was to their interest, break the treaty or that agreement and uh, produce something, that's why this time, as it came time to make a decision, I said, we will continue as long as they continue but we will do it consistent with their observance of the mm -hmm. treaty. That if they go off on their own on something and there's something that uh, is advantageous to us to do the same, we'll do the same. But there is a sense that there's a real difference between a lot of the Reagan campaign rhetoric and uh, Ronald Reagan as president of the United States. That your rhetoric was tough on almost everything. I was going to cut all the deficits. I'm not going to uh, stand by this uh, fatally flawed SALT II treaty. But then as president, your behavior turns out to be much more moderate. No, much I didn't more say. more keeping with what's no, happened. No, I didn't say w about not keeping the treaty or anything. I was one of who openly stated my belief it should not be ratified. Well, a Senate whose majority was of the same party as the president refused mm -hmm. to ratify it. And I agreed with that. Then I came and found this agreement, but I also learned things I didn't know about their capacity for uh, building as versus ours. I was not prepared for how, how far down we were in military capacity, what had been done to us over the years, um, and how far we had to go uh, to rebuild. And with regard to the deficit, yes, in the last, in the, early in the campaign for president, I turned to the best economic advisors that I could find for an economic, economic plan. And under the terms and the things that they told me, yes, they themselves said that we could, under a proper economic plan, end the deficit within a span of years that like by 83, 84, that this could end the deficit. But what no one has paid any attention to is that in those several months that then took place beyond that plan, and my announcing of that plan, I announced it one day in the summer in Chicago, I think, those same experts had to come back and say, wait a minute, the economy has done such a thing that no, uh, it can't be done by that time. And I said that. 
I, I couldn't say anymore that we were going to balance it uh, in those couple of years because 20.5% interest rate, double-digit inflation, unemployment that was, was coming on, the automobile industry literally shut down. Those things, which also is another indication of why we should be very careful about economic projections because uh, there's a limit beyond which they can't project. So they themselves had said these circumstances, they weren't there when we made this original thing. So if the circumstances change, it calls for a different kind of decision by you. Except that the economic plan, because it was an economic plan that was aimed at doing that, we put it into effect. The, I, this charge that I'm responsible for the skyrocketing of the deficits ignores what was <coughs> happening to the deficits in previous years. Yes, they're bigger now than they've ever been. They aren't quite as far out of line if you take them as a percentage of gross national product. Uh, I remember It was consistent with what they've ever said before. You're not really saying that, are you? Well, let's look. All right. While well, I had to engage in something I didn't have to do in California, namely the military yeah. buildup. But we set out to reduce the size of government. We set out to eliminate useless programs. We set out to restore as much as possible to local governments and states authority over programs as a governor. I had seen these grants for federal programs that we then administered in the state and the regulations that came with them, the red tape. And as governor, I, had to, I was able to say, if we could do that program without those restrictions, we could do it for a lot less cost and make it a lot more efficient and do a better job. So I brought that with me here. Now, we took some dozen specific grant programs, categorical grants, and we coupled them into block grants, combined them. And the difference with a block grant is you don't have all of that specific dictating exactly how each program is run. Mm -hmm. In just one situation of that kind, the pages of regula regulations went down from 805 to 31 that were imposed on the local and state governments for managing those programs. I said that I felt that the federal government had usurped too much of the tax. Part of our economic program, even with a recession on, was to reduce taxes, which we did. I'm still holding that taxes are not to be raised uh, because right now, I think it would be a drag on the economy again, and we'd face problems again. But, but you're, you're not telling me you haven't changed on any important issues, because that's almost saying you haven't learned anything on the job. Well, no, I'm talking about the basis of the place of government and what it should do. We have reduced the domestic side of the federal government by about 100,000 employees. All of these, all I'm pointing to is these are... I'm continuing the same things that we did in California. The only thing that difference was in California, I had one big help. When I went into office and discovered in the middle of the fiscal year, because you take office in the middle of that year, that the government was spending at a deficit rate. Considerable deficit had been piled up in those six months already. The California Constitution says you can't have a deficit. I was responsible as a brand new government for having a balanced budget in six months. And that's why, in spite of campaigning against high taxes, I had to ask for a big tax increase because we couldn't implement enough economies in six months to overcome what yes. I'd inherited. Now, I sold the people, though, when we increase those taxes, why it was necessary, and told them also that as soon as we were out of the hole, we'd start giving that money back. 
And the first time that Cap Weinberger, then my finance director, came in and told me that we were going to have a $100 million surplus. And he said, because since you've been here, you haven't been able to do maybe some of the things you'd like to do because of the economic situation. I thought I'd tell you first before the legislature found out about it, because I had a Democrat majority in both houses then, too. <laughs> uh, I, uh, he said, uh, maybe, do you have some favorite program or something? And I said, yes, I do. Let's give it back. And he said, well, it's never been done before. And I said, well, they never had an actor up here before either. So Look, you're, you're much better at answer the, answering these questions than I am at asking them. And, <coughs> uh, we uh, gave the $100 million. <laughs> you know how we gave it back? We told him, we figured out that $100 million came out to about the 10% uh, of the state income tax. Mm -hmm. So we said to everyone when the income tax came due, we said, send us a check for 90% of what you owe. We will use the surplus to make up the other 10. The last surplus we gave back was $850 million. Mm -hmm. And I remember a Democratic senator came in storming into my office on that one. And he said, I consider that an unnecessary expenditure of public mm -hmm. funds. But we're doing the same thing or trying to do them here. And I know there have been these, uh, these challenges that I've, uh, I'll tell you where I think some of them come from, and some of them come from die-hard conservatives. I found this also as governor, that they thought that if I couldn't get everything I asked for, I should jump off the cliff with the flag flying and go down in flames. No, if I can get 70, 80 percent of what it is I'm trying to get, Yes, I'll take that and then continue to try to get the rest in the future. And maybe it's easier to get it as they see that this works. And this was what they were critical of. They couldn't stand it that I would compromise and settle for less than I'd asked. I asked for three 10 percent installments on the tax cuts, 10, 10, and 10. I got five 10 and 10. Should I, should I veto that? Turn it down because it wasn't exactly what I wanted? I didn't get it. I wanted it retroactive to January 1st of the year I started, 1981. No, they wouldn't do that. I had to take it starting uh, now in October, I think it was, with the, uh, the new fiscal year. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, but look what's happened. We've got the recovery and we've got the tax cut, and uh, uh, now we're going to try for tax reform, and maybe that'll get some more <laughs> reduction for the people. If I may ask a few quickies, otherwise I, I'm not I'm not going to peace on my hands uh, at the New York well, Times. I know I've filibustered on some of these, but the, <laughs> the way two. you ask them, I One couldn't say yes or no. <laughs> um, uh, let me ask it just quickly. Uh, you'll see where these questions are going. One is you're getting ready to meet Rajiv Gandhi. Did you, in getting ready for that meeting, did you assume that he's basically a political leader faced with the same kind of forces you are, having to put his pants on one leg after the other, yeah. just the way you are, or that there was something very different about his situation that you had to learn about? Well, yes, you knew that there was a government that was greatly different than ours and a society and an economic structure. But what you do is, uh, uh, and I do with all the heads of state that I've met with, I, I do some uh, biographical research and study that's provided to me. And uh, then I get uh, memorandums from various cabinet sections on uh, our relationship or problems we may have between us or trade situations, problems that may be in conflict or argument between us and so forth. I get all of that and do all of that before they're here. And uh, uh, also what we think would be advantageous mutually uh, if we could arrange uh, things that happen that we'd like to propose to them uh, for their consideration. And Did you read any them. books for the meeting? Uh, no, but I did on this one call in people like Dylan Ripley and uh, uh, who was organizing the great cultural yes. thing and talked to him and some things of that kind and uh, get some kind of cultural background on it. And I had met with his mother already. She had been here, so I, I was prepared for, already for some of the things that 
were, were true, typical of our differences. Question on Bitburg. You made the statement that German soldiers were victims of Hitler as much as the victims of the Holocaust. What was the historical basis for your saying that? All right. Now, you see, I didn't say it that way. That's the way the press said that I said it. I said that everyone, the victims of the bombings, the soldiers on both sides, all were victims, as well as the victims of the Holocaust, were victims of, of Nazism, of that evil thing that brought about that world war. Their lives were interrupted, they died too. But never would I ever suggest that those other victims were victims in the same sense as the victims of the Holocaust. I don't think in all of history there is anything ever quite like that. And I insist that we must never forget it. We must always remember it, and we must remember it with the determination that it will never happen again. Now, on the Bitburg thing, when I said this, yes, those soldiers, uh, you know, uh, some of them were teenagers, uh, as we know, and toward the end of the war and all. But their lives were wasted by this one man. But never would I compare uh, the soldier's death with the torture, the brutality, the things, the scars that the, that the uh, survivors of the Holocaust must bear for the rest of their lives. I don't think any of us can ever quite realize how much we try to empathize and learn about those horrors. I don't think any of us can ever quite understand what is within them and what can be triggered by a number of things in their memories of that. I've had friends that were in those camps. I've heard their stories firsthand. But I also felt this. In my, as I say, history buff nature, I've always believed that, particularly in Europe, in the continual wars, that every time a war ended, it laid the groundwork and the seeds, planted the seeds for the next war. The rivalries, the hatreds, they remained. You still thought after World War I, grew up thinking of the Hun. And then we had the greatest war of all, World War II. And things were different. Maybe a large part of it was due to this country and the Marshall Plan. Here was a nation that once defeated, instead of getting a treaty and saying, well, you can't do this and you can't have, we set out to rebuild a war-ravaged world, including our enemies. And today, our staunchest allies are the countries that were the hated enemy at that time. And 40 years of this. So I felt that the time has come to stop celebrating uh, Armistice Days. Do you remember how many years Armistice Day after World War I was a big celebration? You grew up celebrating your victory over the Hun. Here we had 40 years in which the erstwhile enemies had become, as I say, close allies and friends. There's 40 years of peace and the Germans, and this we must give credit, that Germany did not bulldoze those camps out of existence and then say, let's pretend that never happened, let's not talk about it, let's hope everybody forgets. They've preserved them as tourist sites. They have at Bergen-Belsen, I went through the building that they call their museum. They have the great blown up photos that our people took of the bodies and the emaciated human beings that looked dead already, the graves and so forth. And they bring their school children there and they show them these things and they say, you're seeing this so that you will realize what was done and must never be done again, must never be forgotten. Now, surely the time has come that we can recognize the days of VJ Day coming up and VE Day and recognize them not as times of great triumph, but as times of recognition that back there 40 years ago we not only ended a war, but we started 40 years of what has become friendship and 40 years of peace. And maybe we can have 40 more years uh, 
if we're right. And also, at the Bitburg Cemetery, I was only continuing what has been done by our military and the Allied military for many years. They jointly have gone to these cemeteries and had ceremonies there. So I thought this was a thing of, and it also very necessary. <coughs> I think part of the misunderstanding came about because of my refusal first to go to Dachau. Well, no one asked me what was that all about. I had been asked to be, after the summit, a guest of the state of Germany and to do this thing and to do some other ceremonial things. Another man in political life in Germany, an office holder, but not the head of state, he invited me to go visit Dachau because it's in his district. And I, he was well-intentioned. I don't quarrel with that. But I thought, good Lord, I can't take off as a guest of the state on my own and do this thing over here. And it might be misunderstood as looking as if I'm trying to say, hey, you fellows, uh, look what you did. So I said, no. But when Helmut Kohl called me and said, no, he believed that we should also visit one of those camps. I said, yes, fine. And so it was our own people that helped pick Bergen-Belsen as a better uh, location than, uh, than Dachau would have been. And from the very first, the minute it was part of the state tour, I said yes. And I must say, uh, I think it had a great impact and solidified the relationship between our two countries very well, but never in anything as my speech at Bitburg indicated, uh, did I ever suggest forgetting uh, the Holocaust. In fact, I reminded them all of that. Last question, if I may. All right. Which 20th century president do you admire most and why? <laughs> I don't know whether I can answer that. I must say... You I'm don't want to say a Democrat. I think that's why. No, no, really. I wanted, I'm going to answer it in a peculiar way. I, there are a number of them and a number that I'm, I disagree with on some things, so forth. Uh, no, I, the last Democrat president I campaigned for was Harry Truman, and I campaigned with him uh, at functions and so forth. And uh, I have a great respect and even more respect for many of them since I've sat here at the desk myself. But I, I'm going to pick one out, single him out, not because of the greatest or anything, but because of the least appreciated. I have come in my reading of biographies and all, and I have, in fact, I just recently finished uh, uh, one for one of our assassinated presidents back in the early days, McKinley, but uh, before that, Teddy Roosevelt and all. I think one of the least appreciated is Calvin Coolidge. When you look in his quiet, unassuming way the reduction in taxes, the reduction of the war debt, several installments paid off on the World War I debt while he was in office, and also uh, he had a great sense of humor. Uh, and lately I've been very gratified, I uh, just received another book that his son sent me, that I've been gratified that there are a number of biographers who have been writing tomes about him and saying the same thing and quoting many of his statements and all. But he wasn't a great communicator like Franklin Roosevelt. No, that's right. really had skills to act and to stage manage and yeah. to move a nation. Yeah, that's right. And yet when you read some of the statements, quotes of Coolidge, but that's it. He didn't go out and make them to the world. He maybe said them in a cabinet meeting or someplace. You read some of them and they're very pungent and they're also very darned effective. I remember hearing one story, though, that had to do with you can get something of his nature uh, from something his son said. Uh, you know, his son every summer had to work on the farm. And one day, sitting having their brown paper bag lunch, another kid his age,